And thank you all for joining us here today as we are broadcasting at the Commodity Classic 2023. And we are talking about the bright future of ag, looking ahead with sunglasses and not blinders with our friends at the National Corn Growers Association. I'm Jesse Allen with the American Ag Network and Market Talk. And joining us today, we have some great panel guests with us. Also joining me to co-host is our good friend Mike Pearson with Agriculture of America. Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Jesse, it's good to be here. Love talking about corn. And I'm excited to talk about the future opportunities in agriculture because I think they are legion, Jesse. So let's get into it. Yes, I agree. I think the opportunities are extremely exciting. Joining us here today, he is MDAT Chairman, Colorado Farmer, Troy Schneider with the National Corn Growers Association. Troy, great to have you with us today. Thank you for having us. Also joining us, we have Ellen Zimmerman with the U.S. Grains Council. She is Director of Industry Relations. Ellen, thanks for being here with us. Pleasure to be here. And then also Kate Maher, the executive producer of Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Kate, thanks for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. Well, let's dive in. I think just to start, can you each tell us a little bit about what you do, a little bit about the history of how you got to where you are today in the agriculture industry? Troy, why don't you go ahead and start? Oh, that's a loaded question, Jesse. Uh, when it comes to where I come from, it, it's based in state FFA back in Colorado. And then I've served the last six, seven years on the Colorado Corn Administrative Committee, the checkoff side, and then been involved with U.S. Grains Council and National Corn Growers on the, on the national level, uh, currently serving as the chairman of the Market Development Action Team. And it's just one of those things that the service to our country uh, I know that the opportunity that, you know, we're sitting here looking at some young people that have come up and talked to us. The reason I was able to go, go home and farm was somebody gave it their time, their effort, their talent to go speak on our behalf, uh, agriculture's behalf in Washington, D.C. and state capitals around this, this country. And I want to give back to that. And I want to be a part of that. I want to serve them as young producers and hopefully they can come home and have a profitable, profitable future. Fantastic. Ellen, how about you? Yeah, so uh, like Troy, I, I had a lot of experiences with FFA. I grew up in a farm in Ohio. Um, I had my degrees in agricultural communication. And when I first started, I thought I was going to be an on-air television broadcaster. And through <laughs> um, internships and experiences, found out that that is not uh, what I was meant to do. But was fortunate enough uh, to have some experiences with RFD-TV that uh, led me to kind of understand um, the importance of relationships and uh, kind of building with with each other in the agriculture industry. So from RFD TV, I had uh, an opportunity to work for the Ohio Corn and Wheat Growers Association. That led me to kind of understand the world of commodities. And from there, it kind of took off. So I uh, worked with Ohio Corn and Wheat and then the American Seed Trade Association. And that led me to the U.S. Grains Council where I got to take that experience directly with growers, my experience with agribusinesses at ASTA, put that all together and you have the membership at the U.S. Grains Council. And so Today, I'm the industry relations director there, and I work to connect our members here in the U.S. to our 28 different locations around the world, working to get market access, market development, and move our uh, corn, sorghum, barley, ethanol, DDGs products out of the U.S. To, to where there's opportunities around the world. Fantastic. Kate, how about you? How did you get your start? And tell us a little bit about what you're doing today. Yeah, um, I love Ellen's point about what I was meant to do. Um, so I tell people that I'm a 4-H project on horribly awry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, did not, I, did, I did not grow up in the cattle industry. Um, I grew up in what used to be a very small town in Colorado. Um, and my 4-H project was my dog. Um, and by dog, I mean my mutt dog that my mom uh, adopted, who we adopted when I was a little kid. Um, and I had a lot of friends um, that showed cattle, and so I'd spend a lot of time in the cattle barns. Um, I went to Colorado State to get an animal science degree. I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, one science course in, I realized my brother was the science nerd of the family, um, but I just, I think some things are just in your blood. Um, I got into the, biz the cattle business the old fashioned way. I married into it. Um, and while, and so for many years, um, had a cattle and hay farm um, in Colorado. Um, and even though I am no longer married to the cattle, rancher. Um, again, things are in your blood, and I think that was what I was meant to do. Um, out of college, um, I graduated with an animal science degree business concentration from Colorado State University and went to work for the North American Limousine Association, a cattle breed association there in Denver. 
Um, from there, I went to the U.S. Meat Export Federation, which was really cool. It was kind of like coming out of this little tunnel into this like whole new world. Um, gave me a lot of opportunities. And then a position opened up at NCBA. I was actually in charge of membership when I first started at NCBA. Um, and it was kind of like coming home. Cattle, produce, cattle people are my people. I just, um, I love cattle and the people that raise them. Um, so when they approached me with the opportunity to be the executive producer of our TV show, I was very flattered. Thank you very much. See all these things on the job description that say um, TV production, TV journalism required. Um, and they're like, ah, you can learn all that. And fortunately, we have a great crew that we contract with to do the show. Um, and I love, again, I love cattle and the people that raise them. I can and do talk cattle um, as often as uh, I could do it all day long. And um, my crew will tell you that I, I do. Um, so now I produce our TV show, Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I have the fantastic opportunity of traveling this, this beautiful country and seeing the back roads um, and the people that raise cattle, um, uh, farms and ranches all across the country, a lot of diversified operations. So I get to see a lot of corn and soybeans too. Um, and there's definitely a partnership there. So, um, you know, if you had told me when I was an animal science major that I would be in broadcast journalism, <laughs> I would have laughed in your face. Um, but you know what? You're around an industry long enough and you get to, to, to know it. And especially if you love it, I think you can apply skills anywhere. Fantastic. Very diverse backgrounds for our panelists joining us here today. But let's dive into this uh, uh, great discussion that we can have here today surrounding just the future of agriculture. And I think to start... We have this growing world. It is growing at a rapid rate. We need to feed it. We need to fuel it. What are some ways that we could address that demand that continues to grow? Troy, why don't you start there, just your thoughts. No, the point there is that 95% of the world's population lives outside of our borders. And so it's work with organizations, and they've both been mentioned here, U.S. Grains Council, U.S. MEF, U.S. Meat Export Federation, we take our product through whether it's grain being exported or it's corn-fed beef, pork, lamb. We take that product. We go overseas. We educate. We expose those people or expose our product to those people and let them have a taste of that. And, you know, that, that is our goal here. It, it, recently, I was over in the European Union and the discussion of the Green Deal, the farm to fork, their commitment or lack thereof to feed the world scares me because that is something we have to be very committed to. We want to feed, fuel, and fiber this world and the people that are in it. And I think we do a very good job uh, in all of our products. And it's one of those things that there's no more basic human need than food. And so it's, a, it's just humbling to be a part of that organization or all, all these organizations that do that. Fantastic. Ellen, your thoughts? Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of key points there. One, I think it's important to say like feeding and fueling. Um, the and is really important and not yep. and not the verses because, you know, when you look at ethanol production, uh, that is certainly fueling uh, and it is feeding. You know, the DDGs is a co-product, not a byproduct. And there's a lot of really neat uh, new products coming online there, too. When we're looking at you know high protein concentrated um, options for for those DDGs as well, and when we're looking overseas, we have opportunities like aquaculture that um, you know has a really great return uh, ratio for protein, and uh, you know those more traditional proteins that we see here in the U.S. like pork and uh, beef are, uh, you know, becoming more popular in economies that are coming out of uh, poverty where the middle class is growing. So, um, you know, we're looking in different markets, U.S. Grains Council is looking in Southeast Asia about how can we take uh, how can we educate those dairy farmers about making the most of those feed rations um, and kind of moving the pile of DDGs that we have? And then when we look at Africa, um, you know, how can we're there's a countries there that are going from a dollar a day to ten dollars a day. That means they can never afford protein, so they can afford protein 
once or twice a week. And so uh, we have programs that are, they're training the trainers about, uh, you know, backyard poultry operations. So those things can take off. And again, uh, how can we maximize the reach? How can we educate producers to use the products that we have here in the U.S.? Um, and, and feeding and fueling, I think, is the key there. And I think some of Ellen's points, Kate, obviously feeding corn to our cattle. So we have beef on our table or at tables around the world. That's such an important component here as well. Yeah, it's um, it's a global economy and it's also a growing global population. And it's a growing glo global population that needs to be fed, it needs to be housed, it needs to be clothed, it needs to be fueled, it needs to be employed. And the exciting thing to me is that U.S. agriculture plays a key component in all of those things, including employment. It brings a lot of jobs, um, but that it's the partnerships with, with um, you know, National Corn Growers Association, National Cattlemen's Beef Association, U.S. Meat Export Federation, Grains Council. It's all these things that, that relationships and partnerships um, where we have people that do such a great work. I have such passion for these people um, in providing all of that, the, the feeding, the fueling, the employment, the fiber, the everything, um, and, and taking it to the world. And those relationships, I just think, are key in, in making sure that, that our products get there and we can do so um, very, um, we can do so in a very economical fashion. We can do so in a very sustainable fashion. Um, and it's just so fun to see, see that come together. It's, I guess in my role, I get, I, I have the advantage to see some of that all just kind of come together. It is. It's neat to see it all come together. And you mentioned we're feeding the globe. We're fueling the globe. But when we talk about that, the demand isn't the same everywhere. We've got specific niches that we're able to capitalize on because of those partnerships. Ellen, you take a global purview of the grain industry. What are, what regions of the globe right now stand out to you as a, as a real beacon of hope for corn farmers, grain growers in particular, looking forward? I think it really depends on, on the product, right? So I think there's, um, you know, Africa has a lot of potential for commodity corn in, in the long, long term, long term, mm. several years out. Uh, there's some policy wins we have to take advantage, we have to make happen there when we look at, there's certain countries that have GMO bans currently and that sort of thing. And there's others that, that don't. So I think long term, Africa has huge potential for, for commodity corn. I think when you look at the Middle East um, and the Southeast Asia, DDGs has huge potential, huge potential. What are they going to be doing with DDGs in the Middle East? I don't think of that as a large cattle production area. Is it, Ellen? Uh, no, but aquaculture. Aquaculture ah, is okay. huge there. Um, so they're, they're already um, an area that rely heavily on fish for their protein. And uh, they also do a lot of exporting of fish to other countries where, uh, you know, they may be exporting their fish to Japan for sushi um, and that sort of thing. So aquaculture is going to be really big in Southeast Asia um, and, and the Middle East. I think that is, it's, it's interesting to think about all the different pieces around the world where, like, to Mike's point, we don't think of DDGs in the Middle East. There's so many different little nuggets around the world that, that makes this whole thing go. I think it's, it's just very, very interesting and very exciting when you look ahead in the future. I, I, think, it, I think it's very it's very cool to see, Mike. I mean, Mike, would you agree with that? It it's is. It's it's fantastic to see. And Ellen, I'm, I'm wondering if we can take a step back because yeah. I am a land lover. I yeah. am from Iowa, in the center <laughs> sure. of the country. Fish is not an area where I have much expertise. When we talk about aquaculture, when yeah. we, we've mentioned it a couple of different times, growing source of protein around the world. What what are we talking about? Are these fish that we're feeding out in the ocean? Are they raised in like catfish ponds in Mississippi? What are we looking at in this industry? <laughs> yeah. So it is. Um, you know. You would say like farm raised okay. fish okay. Um, and uh, what's interesting is every species is very very different so the inclusion rate of that ddgs is going to be different for tilapia than it is for sea bass than it is for shrimp than it is for every single uh species and uh you know even in latin america we're seeing aquaculture become really really popular um so yeah and and again that's where we're seeing opportunities for the new products coming online for that high pro too uh because again the inclusion rate um can be different and and um, it's also really interesting when you look at um, the feed that is produced some of it has to sink some of it has to float um, it, because mm. it depends the fish on, eat differently yes exactly exactly huh. I my mind has been completely blown when learning about aquaculture it's been 
fascinating. Much like you, yeah. grew up in Ohio. So, um, yeah, not a lot of aquaculture there. Right. So it's been so fascinating to learn uh, learn about that. Yeah. That is a very different kind of bunk reading, isn't yes. it? When you're, yeah. when you're looking at the inclusion rate. I love yeah. this. This is why I love agriculture because, again, these partnerships where you just yes. learn this stuff and think about it and then it just expands. I think it really gives you the knowledge to, to maybe – take your niche, you know, whether you're feeding cattle or feeding that corn to, to hogs or, or poultry, like it, it, it makes you think about a bigger picture, which I just think makes all of us, all of us better, really. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> bunk reading. <laughs> can you imagine it? <laughs> what, what's, is there going to be like a drone that can bunk read fish and I, like wait? That'll be coming. <laughs> Who knows? Right? I mean, that's, that's the, the cool yeah. thing about this. Once we open an avenue, once we develop a new market, yes. the gloves are off. And that's where the excitement comes and in. The don't you think? technology follows yes. and the yeah. adoption follows. And the money. Yeah. Well, it's all there. I was going to mention the technology because when you put that into the water, how does it break down? How do the pellets break down? How does the feed break down? Because you don't want it to discolor the water. You, you, you want a pristine ocean. You want that water to be pure. So you don't want it to break down, break apart. And that's, I mean, and so you have to have that science in it to have our product just shine through. I should ask, just on the flip side, to be the devil's advocate here. When we think about demand and addressing demand for the world, do we see any challenges in front of us here, either currently or on the horizon, that could impact how we fuel and feed and bring fiber to the world? Oh, there's always challenges. Uh, every day when we wake up, there's challenges. That's the, the th thing that will make us all pull our hair out or turn gray. But it's that challenge that drives us and that excites us. How do we overcome it? How do we take a sure. ban on GMO corn, a, a decree from Mexico, and get around it? How do we take uh, the loss of something um, the cow that stole Christmas back in, I believe, 03. How do we overcome that? We did. Uh, it was a challenge. It's, you know, years ago, the argument was you can't raise enough corn to produce ethanol and feed our cattle. If you look at what we produced in a, as a country in 1980 for our total corn production, we now feed more bushels today to cattle and to livestock in general. I say cattle. That's where my heart's at. But all livestock, we feed as more bushels today to livestock than we raised in 1980. And we're raising about 36% of our, or 29% of our crop goes to ethanol. So it, it's just one of those things. Our production has increased. Um, best thing I could sum it up is you tell the American farmer you can't, they can't do it. They're going to prove you wrong. That's a great point. Great point. And I think those challenges, sorry to jump in, but nope. I think those challenges become opportunities then yeah. eventually. Once you, once you find that challenge, you face that challenge, you solve that challenge, then it's an opportunity. And I think that's what's really exciting about the technology and the people and, you know, the attitude of, um, yeah, we're going to figure out, we're going to figure out how to do this. I mean, we're producing more beef with less cattle mm -hmm. than we did 20 years ago. Um, and we're doing it. It's, it, it just, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to see that. It's really exciting. Definitely. Ellen, any thoughts? Oh, I think, I think Troy said it right. There's always going to be challenges and, and I completely agree. Those turn into opportunities and, um, where I think agriculture really shines is meeting those challenges that turn into opportunities and, and making the most of them. Um, and I think agriculture is a, a community as much as it is an industry. And we see that when we um, have these challenges that turn into opportunities. Fantastic. That's yeah. a really good point. It, yes. we, we're our community. It, it is also an industry. It's like how farmers at home, they're in business, but it's also a lifestyle. There are some yeah. unique overlaps in this business that, that certainly make it fun. We're talking about the opportunity, and I'm, I'm going to kind of pick on Jesse's thing. We're going to be de negative here because we, we do confront these challenges. Ag has issues, particularly when we are as globally connected as we are today. Troy mentioned BSE 2003. We remember the, the impact that had. Ellen, when you think about what's happening around the world right now, what are some issues that have you a little nervous, even though hopefully we will get them overcome? Sure. Um, well, I don't want to say nervous. I would say okay. uh, I would say the, the things that we're getting the most questions on right now okay. um, would be the Mexico decree, certainly, mm -hmm. and kind of where we're at with, um, you know, the consultations from USTR and, and that 
process being started. Could we take a step back Absolutely. real quick and just talk in case we have folks who aren't familiar with what Mexico is trying? Could you give us just the elevator pitch? What are they doing down there? Yeah. So there are um, two different presidential decrees in Mexico, um, which would be similar to like our executive orders here in the U.S. So essentially effective immediately. They are law that says there's no GMO corn and no glyphosate. Um, and so what that means is there's a lot of concern about trade crossing the border and then also stifling innovation. And so not getting access to technology. If our number one customer for grains in all forms are saying no glyphosate, what does that mean for technology coming down the pipeline for our seeds? Um, so that those are that's that's what is kind of big picture. We just recently had an update on that decree that came out on February 13th. So oh, very recent, very recent, very recent. And that kind of uh, changed the language a little bit that said um, that there was going to be the ownership of enforcing that decree was going to be on industry or the importer. OK, so that's an important note about how. Um, how that legally takes place with USTR. From a trade perspective, does that make us as American grain exporters more comfortable with what they're trying to do down there? Um, I, I'm not sure. Okay. I have not heard from okay. it, importers. So far, it hasn't there. changed it. Yes, okay. exactly, exactly. No trade has stopped yet. Gotcha. Okay, not with the old decree and not with the current decree. Perfect. Um, and then the other key pieces is that it said no white corn at all. Uh, GMO white corn for human consumption mm. and no yellow corn once they have self-sufficiency or another option, essentially. Okay. And so that's really, really vague and hard, hard to work with, right? Yeah. And that's, there's still a lot of question marks on that. Okay. So what's our timeline that we're working with on this issue? So USTR initiated consultations on Monday. That's a 30-day period. And they initiate, initiated the consultations through the um, sanitary, phytosanitary chapter within the USMCA. So they're saying this is not science-based. And so after those 30 days, if a conclusion is not reached between the two countries, then a panel is called to further investigate total timeline from that letter from USTR on Monday to hopefully resolution is nine months. Okay. Nine months. And that clock is ticking. Correct. Clock is ticking. And, you know, it sounds like it's going to be a time for a lot of education on these important issues, these SPS, phyto, sanitary and phytosanitary issues. Ellen, is, is this an opportunity to help tell that corn in America story some more? Is that how we should embrace this next nine months? Yeah, so, you know, the U.S. Grain Council really supports that, uh, the step that USTR has taken, and we really, uh, you, the corn farmers really appreciate, you know, that step from USTR, too. Um, and so I, I would say it's going to be important for conversations to be open and, and to keep talking, because we're going to have to watch that grain trade, right, mm -hmm. to, see, to see what happens there. Yeah. Very true. Troy, thoughts from the corn growers' perspective off what Ellen said? Well, when that second decree came out, the new decree came out the week of Valentine's, it worried us because, yes, that language of we will accept yellow corn until we, ha until we find a suitable alternative, that left such a door open that it's like, okay, when will they flip that switch? They moved that white, the white corn ban up almost a complete year from, that, you know, from the first decree to this one. I think Alan said the, the key is communication. We have to communicate, 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 keep the, the conversation going, keep it moving forward, keep it moving toward that science-based approach that we, we want to come out to. Um, you know, and, and the one thing that gives me the greatest heartburn is this. The, there's not a ban on soybeans. Our friends at soybeans are not banned. Why not? It's still a GM a genetically modified crop. So what are we doing there? Why are we singling out corn? So, um, I you know we we need to get we need to get to the bottom of that. The next nine months will be very interesting, and as we move forward, we will keep an eye on it at National Corn. And I know uh, President Tom Haig has been v visiting with uh, Secretary Vilsack, uh, UST, USTR, and moving things forward there and making sure that our message is heard. 
Fantastic. Mike? Great points. Kate, I've got a question for you. We're talking about the corn industry here, but of course, one of the, I believe the largest utilizer of that corn is the beef industry. And we've seen cattle producers have had a tough couple of years. We've seen a lot of volatility in that market. You work with folks across the country. How are cattle feeder, cow calf producer attitudes as we head into this next year? You know, um, we just, uh, NCBA just had their, um, our convention here recently. Um, you know, I think attitudes are really positive. There is opportunity out there. Um, you know, I think in terms of, of challenges, we're concerned with um, some of the legislation and regulations, of course, because um, regulations place a big burden on those people that are trying to feed and fuel and fiber a growing global economy. Um, Waters of the U.S. concerns us, you know, even even issues like our friends in the in the grains world that are um, dealing with with this Mexican decree, um, it's not science based, and that really concerns us because that's what we deal with a lot too, is making sure that things are science based. Um, but you know what? With partnerships with our our team in D.C., um, we have a really I mean, we're the voice of the cattle producers in D.C., and so our staff does a lot of great work to make sure that um, our producers can keep operating. As long as our producers can keep operating. They're they're happy, you know. They just they just want to they want to raise cattle. They want to, you know, we'll get. I'm sure we'll get into this later on sustainability and the climate and all that. But you know, yep. they they just want to they want to do their job, and and do it well, which they do, and be allowed to do it. But you know, attitudes are really pretty positive. You know, I mean, not much you can do about the markets, but there's some exciting um, new things out there, um, especially through um, you know farm bill discussions, et cetera, that um, producers can take advantage of. Um, risk, you know. Um, LRP is a great new tool. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of things to, that that can help them, um, but it's 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 exciting to it's, it's exciting to see opportunities. It's, it's it's exciting for me to see beef producers be excited about opportunities. Yes. And Kate, I want to pick up on something you mentioned because we're talking about opportunities. We're talking about young people's availability or ability to get into agriculture and find success. Cattle has for a long time been an avenue for that. You can start with a few acres, but also LRP. Can you spend a moment just talking to us about how this has changed maybe the economics perhaps of, of cow-calf production, cattle feeding, and why NCBA supports it? Sure. Um, I cannot get into very, I, I can't get into the ways. Right. I'm, it's a I'm, very, my, contact uh, your insurance agent yes, is the moral exactly. of the story. Um, but in, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have the, the, the brain power to grasp all the my, minutia of it, except that it has been a fantastic tool to help producers manage some of that market volatility. Yeah. You can't control the weather. You can't control the markets. Well, maybe now you can a little bit on, on one of those. Um, and, you know, NCBA has been a big supporter of that. Again, just because anything that helps beef producers, cattle producers, be profitable and stay in business is, is a good thing. Then we can keep utilizing all this beautiful corn that, that we feed. Um, you know, we can we can keep protecting the land and natural resources. We can, you know, make a an, an industry for a future generation. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. I'm really excited about the first generation that are, that are getting into the cattle industry um, that really have a desire to do that and are finding some really fun and unique ways to make that happen, um, you know, first gen coupled with next gen means that there's there's a lot of opportunity ahead. Um, but yeah, the the um, livestock risk protection is a fantastic program. I would say that everybody really, at least, look into it. Yes. Um, it's been yep. uh, at all the state conventions I've been to. Um, Cattlemen to Cattlemen did a whole show about it. Um, you know, it's really something that's getting a lot of interest, and it's you know, there's. The, the State Cattlemen's Association has had a lot of speakers on it, so I would really encourage people to look into it. Um, it's, it's really just a fantastic program, and NCBA is going to continue to support USDA's efforts in that. Kate, where can the audience go to watch that Cattlemen to Cattlemen episode on LRP? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't really a shameless plug, but thanks, Mike. <laughs> We're going to turn um, it into one. <laughs> okay. Um, cattlemen, uh, YouTube doc, uh, YouTube.com slash Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We have a YouTube page. If they just uh, go on there and search on our page, um, uh, risk management. Uh, we talk a lot. Uh, we, we did kind of a whole show um, around that. There's this program through USDA um, called ERMI, which is educating risk management or something risk management education. <laughs> um, but there, there's other avenues too. I mean, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of risk management that can be done that's not even insurance related or, or, or market related 
um, in terms of managing forages, in terms of managing um, animal health and herd health and, and genetics. It's just really incredible what all goes into that. So we kind of we kind of cover the gamut on what producers are doing, and I think there's a lot of great education in there. Um, you know, beef production is so so different regionally across mm -hmm. the country that risk management looks different in Northern California than it does in Southern Virginia. Um, and but there's something to be there. there. It's possible on every single cattle operation, and you don't have to have 5,000 head of cattle to do to do this. You can have a yeah. a, a small herd. Um, I always say that if you have five head of beef cattle, you are part of the beef supply chain, and there are opportunities for you um, to do the same things that the guys and the people that are running 5,000 head of cattle do. You know. Sure. Troy, and you it had, takes all sizes to do to make to make beef for the world. Yeah, Sorry, Troy, you had something to add there. I <laughs> think you mentioned the YouTube channel, but isn't it much must watch TV on Tuesday night on RFC It TV? is must see TV <laughs> on Tuesday night. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Cattleman to Cattleman does air on um, on RFD TV eight thirty p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday nights. Then we re air Saturday morning. Um, new episodes uh, episodes every week. Uh, we're currently in new episodes. Um, I'm going to put in a plug for our Ag Day. Yeah. We have Ag Day coming up. Um, Cattleman to Cattleman is going to celebrate that with a special episode that we produce from Texas. Will you be on the Capitol? Will you be going to D.C.? What are you going to be talking yeah, about? No. Um, you know, last year we did it from the Capitol. This year we went to the Lone Star State. We went to Texas oh. and we visited with uh, cow-calf producers, Environmental Stewardship Award winners. We visited with cattle feeders in the Texas Panhandle, and we visited with an incredible um, butcher shop in the Fort Worth area. So it's kind of a gate to plate, really experience for Earth Day awesome. and and uh, how that product gets gets around. And just a just a tribute to those those people that I mean, you know, cattle feeders that are feeding feeding that corn every day and uh, and utilizing that partnership to to make beef. I think your statement gate to plate. I think that's a great segue for us here to the other part of our conversation today, sustainability. So let's dive into that. We've spent a lot of time talking demand side, sustainability. You know, there's a lot of buzzwords out there around it right now. There's a lot of momentum behind sustainability and different things to do on the farm and throughout agriculture. But let's just start with the basics. What does sustainability mean to you? Troy, do you want to take that first? Sustainability, you know, it's got the it's that three legged stool. You've got environmental, you've got social, you've got economic. You have to have all three of them there, or it doesn't work to be talking just about one. And you know, when you guys talked about gate to plate, there, how cool is it? You take a little seed, you know, and I've got uh, just you can hold them in your hand. You take that kernel of corn, put it in the ground, you raise it, turn that around, and hey, guys, look at it. We're we're making. We're putting corn into the feedlot, but then we're also taking corn to the ethanol plant, distiller's grain out the backside to the feedlot to finish cattle off, and then we're fueling our cars. And so uh, you've, you've taken an environment that is in the Great Plains where only a cat, the cow-calf operation makes that environment. We can turn that grass into a protein, and we use corn to finish that off. We, we make a better product out of it. And then we help our environment with that ethanol. I, I don't know what would be cooler. You know, what's more American than that right there? Putting it all together. And that's what excites me. And for sustainability, you know, we're doing more with less. Kate made the comment that we are producing more beef with less animals right now. Corn can say the same thing. We're producing more corn with less acres. And we have to keep moving that needle forward, you know, the, the original environmentalists are the ranchers and farmers of the, of the United States. So as they move forward, they'll tell their story. Uh, we have our goals at NCGA posted for 2030. We've looked back as to where we were from 1980 moving forward, what we've increased, what we've decreased, made improvements on. And I know we've had conversations with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association on, okay, their leadership's had talk to us about help us tell that story we can tell it from the grass to the feedlot help us finish that story what what's going on in the feedlot and then with u.s grains council i'm going to throw it over to ellen we've u.s grains council along with with some work with ncga uh namely the sustainability report you guys just launched your sustainability certificate correct yeah so um 
we we don't certify anything. We have records of sustainability. I think that's a, an important distinction. Um, but so what we have is the Corn Sustainability Assurance Protocol. And what that is, is it's a document that talks about all of the ways that farmers already are sustainable and all of the ways that they are already documenting their sustainability practices and uh, you know, recording those the programs that they're enrolled in with USDA um, and working on sustainability um, and have been for, for decades. Uh, I, I think about sustainability for me, um, I, I feel this way about the same way I do when I, when I was talking about, um, you know, herd management when I was growing up on a pig farm. Um, we care very much about each one of those pigs because they are, you know, our, our livelihood. And we care that they're healthy and taken care of and their well-being because it's important to us that they live a healthy life and, and you know, do their job for us. Um, and, and I think about that the same way of sustainability for farmers because they care about the land. They drink the same water that everyone else does. So they care about water quality. They care about uh, the inputs. They care about how many times they, they drive over the field. Uh, for fuel management and all of those things. So um, I think, you know, to, to Troy's point, farmers are the original uh, stewards of the land and, and always have been really passionate about taking care of this planet. Um, and the Corn Sustainability Assurance Protocol is a way of documenting that. And, and then the records of sustainability is a way for customers and overseas markets to get a record of sustainability on a shipment to say this corn was raised sustainably um, and, and use that as, as a tool for them in whatever market that that may be for their end users. Um, and we're seeing that um, that was just launched in uh, on February 15th. So it's very, very new. Um, and we're excited to see that take off in, in our overseas markets. Fantastic. Go ahead. Well, I've got a follow-up question yeah. to Ellen talking about this working again in that geopolitical international affairs arena. Are you hearing from other countries who are concerned about sustainability? I mean, is that mainly coming from Europe? And if so, what are they looking for? Well, how do they measure sustainability? Yeah. So the, the, Corn Sustainability Assurance Protocol, it's a lot of words, so I'm going to call it CSAP okay. from, from now on, um, is is aligned, it's not, it kind of uses the same benchmarks as the EU to okay. say, okay, EU, this is your, this is what you're saying sustainability is, this matches what we're doing in the U.S. So we are sustainable and it uses the mass balance approach again for this because our farmers are already enrolling in all of those programs with USDA. So uh, farmers don't have to do anything to say that their corn is sustainable. They've already done it. Um, there's, they don't have to do anything on a website. They don't have to do anything because uh, it's the mass balance approach. So uh, all, all of our, it, it kind of all fits in together and you're exactly right. The geopolitical space, we use those benchmarkers globally to come up with this is and we're speaking their language exactly. we're telling you this is what you yep. say you want all right this is what we're doing yep. i love to see that and yep. for your listeners out there that is something u.s grains council along with national corn we've been working on that since around 2018 i mean how how do we do this i mean it was let's go ahead let's get this done now and then it was okay let's back up a little bit let's walk before we run Absolutely and get this right. We're only going to get to do it once. And the approach that Grains Council has taken is very impressive to me as a farmer. Well, Excellent. and Kate mentioned the importance of partnerships, you know, kind of several times. And I think this is a really, really good one where uh, NCGA said, you know, here's our sustainability report. And we use that kind of as a base of, you know, here's what farmers are saying and talking about, and this is the report. And, and then we took that and matched that to our global sustainability definitions and, and kind of merged that together. And, and we have CSAP. That is cool. Will it be changing year to year? Is this, an, is this a live document, so to speak, that will update as farmers change their behaviors and practices? So the CSAB will stay the same. We do have a board of directors unless they say, you know, it's time for this to have a, a, a revision. So we do have, um, you know, it's, there's an LLC and a board of directors kind of managing that and the records of sustainability that are being, um, you know, sent for shipments that are that are being exported. So uh, there is a management system to make sure we're, we're staying aligned as, as, you know, dynamics change. Absolutely. Very cool. Kate, your thoughts on sustainability to jump into the conversation here a little bit, you know, obviously between cattle and, and 
grains, corn, et cetera. What's your thoughts on just sustainability and what it means to you? Yeah. Um, well, you know, in CBA, um, we did also set a, um, we have, we released sustainability goals um, at our convention last year in Houston. Um, so it's, again, very important to, to the organization, to the industry, to the producers. Um, to me, the environmental part of it, and I, I know I'm biased because of my, my job and what I get to see, but that's that's the easy box for me. Um, the best the best care takers of natural resources are those that live and work with natural resources. So to me, that's that's a simple part. Um, I focus. I think a lot about sustainability with with the social and kind of economical aspect of it, um, especially in keeping ag land in production you know when you think about urban encroachment once once you build something on that piece of ground that was producing corn or beef or strawberries or whatever it's not going to ever do that again and so to me that's that's really important to to keep um <laughs> you, you talk about rural i guess rural communities rural and, and agricultural mm -hmm. communities mm -hmm. agricultural whether that's right outside of um, Orlando, Florida, there's a lot of beef cattle here in Florida, whether that's right outside here, whether it's in a town of, of 20 people in, in the middle of the country. Um, agriculture plays a great role in society um, in terms of those communities, in terms of those people that live there, um, just in terms of, of, of that um, that production. And again, if you take those natural resources out, those are less natural resources to give back to the environment. And I think that sometimes maybe people outside of agriculture don't necessarily think about it that way. Um, you know, and then it's the, it's economic, not only to those communities and to the revenue generated and the jobs generated by those farms and ranches. Um, and, and yes, it's a, it's a, it's a livelihood. It's a business. Um, you know, Ellen mentioned the, the care that, that um, people give their animals and they all do. Um, I think what's really exciting is that, um, not only do they care about those animals because they're their livelihood, but because they like animals. I remember being on a, a just I remember being on a shoot in Montana a couple summers mm -hmm. ago, and we're out in the field, Red Angus cattle, and the rancher he turns to me and he looks at me. He's like, "I love cows," and I mean, almost with tears in his eyes. They love their animal. I mean, they're not, you know, I mean, it's they know what they're doing. They know they're raising something that has a very noble purpose. Um, so it, you know, it, it is that three-legged stool that Troy talked about, but. In terms of social and economic, I want to keep that. I just I want to keep that egg land egg because you got to keep food production viable in this country. Yeah, and you know you mentioned the social aspect of that ESG concern, and as you talk about rural life, keeping this farmland in production that also supports the rural communities. Yes. It keeps the school open in southern Iowa and rural Montana. That to me is a social aspect we we ought to be considering. And I had Kate, so thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. It's it's something that. Our rural communities, I come from a town of 100 people in north central Iowa. I mean, they're, they're, there's something about just the fabric of that community and that social aspect. And I would agree with you, Mike. I think it's something that we, we lose sight of when we talk about all of this. And so I, I'm glad you brought that point up. I wonder as well, there's a lot of things that we, we mentioned a couple times that farmers and ranchers, they're the original stewards of the land. But there's also sometimes some things that, you know, we're hearing a lot of different confusion surrounding various sustainability programs. A lot of farmers are, you know, not understanding the tools that are available to them. So they're just saying, well, if I don't understand this. Why am I going to do it? But I think, you know, the title of this panel is looking ahead with sunglasses and not blinders. Can we talk a little bit about that side of it with just the amount of technology and data and everything else that is out there in front of us throughout agriculture to lend a hand in sustainability. What what are your thoughts on that? Troy, do you do you have some thoughts to start, possibly? You know, as we look forward, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, down at the sheet here and what excites you about the future. I'm going to tie those two together a little bit. Okay. You know, you talk about the technology and it's jobs. When you talk ag and the things that are going on in the ag industry, whether it's raising corn, whether it's the cattle industry, the technology, the science-based technology, the jobs that we need coming out of the universities and the young people, you know, if uh, anybody out there listening uh, as a young person, if you don't have an opportunity to go back home to your farm and ranch, take a job and, you know, be an advocate, work in a science industry. Uh, I mean, I, my college roommates over in, in uh, Pivot Bio right now, 
working there. He didn't have a chance to go home to the family farm, but he took that job, worked for Corteva, moved over to Pivot Bio. He's still advocating. No, he's not going to Washington, D.C. to speak on our behalf, but he's still representing us. It's still part of this industry, just like you guys in the radio. It, it is that community. And as we go forward, that is the key. You know, we were joined by young people here today before we started the show. I would just encourage them, whatever they do, if you can't go back home and be in production, ag, go be that advocate. Find something to do to help that rural way of life, what we're talking about. Because um, once it slips away from us, once we lose public sentiment, we become what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point it out again, the European Union, uh, foreign countries. And the farmers are, they feel alienated. And we cannot afford to let that happen here. Sure. I think I'm glad you kind of tied those two questions together. I think they go together well. So I'll, Ellen, I'll send it to you. Your your thoughts on this? Yeah. So I think one one issue and one opportunity that um, I, I haven't touched on much is I think the ethanol industry and the yes. opportunities it has, especially in the sustainability uh, realm. It has a lot of opportunities. Uh, to you know, lower greenhouse gases. When we look at um, other markets where they're looking for clean air solutions and, and that sort of thing, if you raise the blend rates in that country, you know that is an immediate solution to to lower uh, you know air pollution in, in that sort of thing. That is a green solution that is immediate. You uh, that that can be implemented fairly quickly as well. And so I think you know ethanol in as just like. You know, a E10, E15, you know, whatever that blend rate is, has a lot of opportunities uh, in, in a lot of different markets. And then uh, when you talk about innovation and new tools and that sort of thing, sustainable aviation fuel yes. is something that's coming down the pipeline pretty quickly, too, that I think the ethanol industry is getting really excited about, too. And a couple of other uh, really neat options. And when we look at, uh, there's a couple of key markets. You know, India was our number four top customer for ethanol in the last marketing year, number two the year before, uh, they're industrial use only for ethanol. And, you know, they they have a, a almost an E10 blend rate already in that country, and they're importing for industrial uses. So I think ethanol has a lot of potential uh, for, you know, the green solutions uh, in, around the world, but also here in the U.S. Fantastic. Ellen, I've got a question about that because we've seen a lot of environmental folks not take quite a shine to ethanol over the past 15 years. But now that the focus is greenhouse gases and ethanol is proven to make a difference there, are they coming around in D.C.? Are you hearing uh, are you hearing ethanol come into a better focus in Washington? Well, so I don't do much in D.C. for policy. So um, I, I, I can't speak too much to that, but we are getting a lot of traction um, in, in policies around the world. So okay. I, I would get, I would have to hope and uh, fingers crossed here in, in Washington, D.C. too. That's, that's a just great not point. my area. No, that's true. <laughs> you're, you're the D.C. of every place else yes. is, is where you spend your time. Right. Yes, yes. Yes. No, thank you for that. Exciting to see that come back into focus yes. from an environmental perspective. Fantastic. Definitely. Uh, Kate, your thoughts just on some of the things when we look at the future and some of the different data that we can use in the cattle industry. I know there's a lot of great technology being used there right now. And I know a lot of ranchers have adopted a lot of those things in the feedlot on the farm. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, you know, um, it always amazes me um, it, looking in different industries that talk about sustainability and, and how they are, I mean, they don't have to have the conversation necessarily with their end user or their consumer um, about about the technology. Technology and food production is a little, little scary and touchy, and I get that. But man, isn't it so cool what science can do for us, you know? Yeah. And, you know, Ellen mentioned the sustainable fuel and agriculture Agriculture is going to contribute to that. And that's just, that's so awesome um, because we're, uh, we're not, we're just like every other industry. Science and technology makes us better. It makes us more efficient. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of technology coming down, um, down the pipe in terms of cattle production, whether, um, you know, research on how can we maybe, um, you know, well, while the cow is, is a super is a super animal, super being, um, you know, and we don't want to change that the makeup of her, but how can we reduce the methane emissions from cattle? Right. You know, there's technology and there's research being done on that. Um, you know, there's technology in, in range and pasture. Um, that's a big part of it too. Um, there's a lot of discussion on carbon credits and things like that. Yep. The exciting thing is to me that producers are already doing this. So it's not going to be 
a, a terribly heavy lift or an imposition on them. Um, it's just sort of getting them caught up, I think, to the conversation because it takes a lot of hard work and days are full to get the, to get corn or cattle to, to market, honestly. Um, and so I think as those conversations evolve, um, I think, again, it's it's going to be that technology, which has always, I think, been embraced by, by farmers and ranchers, um, you know, and... I think that also gives us an opportunity to, especially Troy mentioned kids going into school and, and what are they going to focus on? And there's a lot of ag science and ag technology coming up. And, and I think with their attitudes and their um, acceptance of technology, maybe some of those conversations change too, where technology and food production kind of now go hand in hand and we can have an easier conversation and talk about how that can be really sustainable. Um, and it doesn't have to be a, be a, you know, a scary kind of a scary kind of thing. Yeah. We're not going to feed a growing population with a little house in the prairie model anymore. Um, so I think there's opportunities and, and some good things on that, um, and, uh, and and opportunities for producers to take advantage of of these conversations um, as well. And again, we're we're already they're already doing it. We're already delivering a sustainable product to the people that want them. Um, you know, it's just again, being able to kind of adapt to the parameters, whether it's from the European Union or whether it's from, you know, a Walmart branded beef program type of thing. Right. Great point. Well, I know we are getting close to time. We have a few minutes left. So I think just some final thoughts here over everything we've talked about today and anything that we have not discussed that you want to mention here. Uh, Kate, I'll start with you on this one here. Just uh, final thoughts before we wrap up. Um, well, I think kind of back maybe to where we started and, and what it is it going to take to feed fuel and fiber, et cetera, a growing population. It's going to take all kinds of agriculture. Um, I, again, I'm just really excited about the first generation folks that want to get into it. I, I guess I'm just, look at what agriculture can do. Um, I guess I'll close with this. We were taping a show recently with some uh, panelists that we were discussing conservation easements. And one of them had a, a point that just, it gave me goosebumps. He said, because of some of the work that we're doing in conservation and in sustainability and in new technologies and animal care and handling and beef quality assurance and all this, it lets us shift the conversation to the value of agriculture to a society. And I just, that's it chills up my spine because I'm like, finally, 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 look what agriculture can do for for everyone here and and around the globe it just it's 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 fun it's great that's great yeah ellen yeah i think uh, what i'm most excited about for the future of agriculture is the the same things that i was excited about when i got into the agriculture industry uh i still believe it's a community i still think we are innovators and I still think we're extremely resilient. And no matter what the challenge is, it's gonna turn into an opportunity and we're gonna we're gonna meet it head on and come out the other side stronger and better. Fantastic. Troy, final thoughts from you from the corn growers perspective. You know, we've talked about young people and what and what opportunities are out for them to be in agriculture, to be an advocate. Uh, I wanna speak to the, the producers out there, whether they're corn producers or whether they're in the cattle industry. Take pride in that checkoff. Not only take pride in that checkoff, but take the time to fill out the membership because the numbers were, our numbers are going down just because there's less and less people in agriculture. We need everyone to step up to the table and be a member, be part of that checkoff. Fantastic. Couldn't agree more. Mike, final questions from you. Know, you know, my final thought would be is as young folks, particularly as first generation or the folks new to agriculture come in, there's so much happening in this industry. Learn, read, listen, pay attention to what's going on because there is a new piece of news in agriculture every single day. And I would also say find a mentor. There's a lot happening. Yes. There's not a lot you're going to know when you jump into this. Find somebody who's done there. Find somebody who's stubbed their toe and figure out how they did it. I think we've all said that in a roundabout way about finding a mentor and, and using all the tools at your disposal. I think that is so key with the future that we're looking at throughout agriculture. Really great discussion. Thank you all for joining us. Mike Pearson, again, thank you for co-hosting the panel with me. I appreciate you, it as always. And again, thanks to Troy Schneider, Ellen Zimmerman, Kate Maher. Thank you all for joining us here during Commodity Classic. We appreciate it. And this has been the bright future of ag looking ahead with sunglasses and not blinders. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Jesse Allen.